Welcome to Round the Table Live with Chris Concern. My name is Tim Diep, and today we are discussing the remarkable case of an evangelical Christian uh, lecturer in an evangelical Bible college who was dismissed for tweeting about his Christian convictions. I'm delighted to welcome Aaron Edwards here um, online with us today. Great to see you, Aaron. Uh, thank you for joining us so much. Looking forward to the conversation now. And we've also got Joe Boot as well, um, joining us as well, who has his own connection with Cliff College as well. And before, But before we get into the conversation, let's just play a little video that summarises what happened uh, to Aaron. So let's play the video. It's an amazing irony that I'm a Bible College lecturer who is dismissed for speaking about a biblical opinion. This is my tweet. It wasn't me attacking gay people. It wasn't me even attacking pro-LGBT people. It was just naming the fact that homosexuality is invading the church because that's what I believe is happening. My tweet was about the gospel and it should be a perfectly acceptable opinion for an evangelical lecturer to share especially one who works at an evangelical Bible college. Here's the college's response, which they made uh, at the time. I think the college, in this case, bowed to the mob and decided that they wanted to denounce me publicly. I didn't intend to cause the college trouble or the Methodist church, but I did warn them that an evangelical cannot express the view that homosexuality is sinful. So my tweet is just evidence of what is going to happen for many other Christians if they really want to express that view. Great. Well, uh, look, we can see what happened there, Aaron. How, you know, what is your feeling now, um, um, having sort of been dismissed for that and so on? How are you feeling about it at this point? Yeah, thanks, Tim. And that's, that's the first time I've seen that video, so that's interesting. <laughs> as I was watching it from a, yeah, another perspective. Um, it was, yeah, I, I'm feeling kind of, um, I, I'm kind of feeling okay about it now in the sense that I've I've done, a, I've gone through quite a mire since the uh, since that all happened originally I kind of I've, I've sort of lost track of time I think we're five weeks in from the tweet right um yeah you know, roughly that amount of time so I've kind of reflected on, on it a lot I've I've been discussing a lot I've been doing all sorts of documentary process um in relation to challenging it and that kind of thing within the uh, appeals process of the college um but in terms of how I'm feeling about it now I kind of just see that this is the inevitability that I, as I alluded to, as my strange self that I was watching there um, alluded to in the video, I, I had yeah. warned about this for many years. So some have sort of critiqued me to say, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you putting the college in trouble? So I, I've literally said, this is what's going to happen. I didn't expect to be the one who was going to be the fall guy. I just said, this is what an, an evangelical won't be able to express the view about sin. Yeah. And so for me, that's where the issue is. I guess we'll get into that further on, but that, in terms of how it's affected me, I've it's been really hard, um, but at the same time, I've been really encouraged. And, and so, just, so encouraged explain, just, just give us a bit of background. You know, what was your job at Cliff College? How long have you been there? Did sure. you enjoy it? That's that sort of thing. Yeah, I was there for seven years. So um, 2016 is when I joined the college, um, and I was there to. I was a lecturer in theology, preaching, and mission, and I um, ran the Masters in Mission program. Um, so that was the kind of main responsibilities. I was I was lecturing, tutoring. Um, really enjoyed it. You know, lo loved being able to sort of shape the program in the direction I thought was needed. Um, in fact, when I inherited it, I think there were a few issues of um, um, it having lost some of its evangelical distinctiveness. I think I picked some of that up in some of the feedback um, on on previous modules. Not that whoever came before me was uh, not doing a good job in other ways, but it's just that I, I think as a college there had been a bit of a mission drift um, away from evangelical distinctives. We'd had some. We'd had Steve Chalk. Uh, the year previously to speak at our um, uh, annual festival. So I, I saw this, that as a moment, right, we really need to try to bring the college back in an evangelical direction. And I think I was able to help influence that for a few years in terms of um, processes, decisions that were made, um, statements that were made publicly. Um, I was enjoying being able to sort of carry some evangelical influence, help bring, um, encourage others um, along that journey. Other faculty we brought in during that time were more robustly evangelical. Um, the modules I put together were more overtly evangelical and we kind of you know, minimise some of the things that were less helpful without losing the proper critical uh, discussions that need to be had at any higher education institution doing postgraduate work. So, so I, yeah, that was a, a good process and a really 
kind of enjoyable to kind of build into that project until things started uh, changing a few years into it. And, and that's where some of the challenges came. And if, if you're watching live, we can see your comments on YouTube or Facebook and do comment away or ask questions. I see Heather Scammell there has said our left Methodist at URC Church when the Methodists embrace same-sex marriage. So great for people like Aaron who still take a godly stance. Too many church denominations dallying with the spirit of the age, which um, raises the question, Aaron, um, just explain to us what is the position of the Methodist Church on same-sex marriage and... Yeah and sexual ethics generally yeah so uh, a couple of years ago they voted in at the methodist conference for um to welcome two uh contradictory views on marriage basically so the phrase they came up with to baptize this um what may call an abomination um of a theological decision um was to say you can just have two views which contradict each other and we can all get along and it's fine and basically it's, it's not saying that you, you can't be an evangelical and believe in heterosexual only marriage but we are saying you have to accept both views or accept the possibility of both views and respect them both so the other so just basically they voted on same-sex marriage being god being okay with it basically after all these years of us misunderstanding i found marriage. it extraordinary that they would actually you know say we accept contradictory views because that that is actually nonsense that is this is obviously a sign of post post you know post-truth society Yes. Except your contradiction means you believe anything in the world. I mean, you can believe pigs fly. I can prove that pigs fly from a contradiction. You know, yeah. you know if you accept a contradiction, you don't really believe anything. You know, you or you believe everything. I mean, you know, there's no real beliefs. Once you accept a contradiction, there's no meaning yeah. in it. It's completely meaningless. Yeah. And I think I think uh, I'd um, only to stop there. Uh, someone who is a critical jumping on uh, on us discussing it like that, they'd probably come in and say, "Well, we don't think all contradictions are fine." We just think on some <laughs> issues there is, you know, there's enough traction, there's enough people, and therefore, we, you know, we've we've baptized this contradiction, but not that contradiction. There's some contradictions that, are fine. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't. I just yeah. I can't take that seriously at all. Yeah, we're always thinking of the Orwellian line in Animal Farm: "What all animals are equal, some are more equal than others." All contradictions are contradictory, but some are less contradictory than others. You could <laughs> um I, I think that's how the methods have gone with it but so so i think yeah that it's basically the idea yeah you can have both and you have to respect both and my whole argument then there's a, a, a year years of a process building up to this point so it wasn't just that they voted on it there were years yeah. of discussions yeah and, but the yeah. working party this is this is where the the devil is in the details indeed and um, there's a working party of eight people who spent at least two years working on a report to send to the methodist conference of that mm -hmm. panel only one of them was an evangelical, which was the Cliff College principal. Right. And he was only there to try to fight for a conscience clause for evangelicals so that they didn't have to uh, perform same-sex weddings in their churches. That's the only thing he was able to even fight for. Right. Um, and his view is far more irenic um, and trying to replicate both sides. I would disagree with him. I challenged him a few times saying, it's no point you having the view of being uh, pro, uh, not, you know, of being pro traditional marriage if you're not really going to fight for it. So he was, it was an interesting situation. We once had a conversation and he said, uh, I'm conservative on same-sex marriage, but probably not as conservative as you are, Aaron. And I said, I don't know what that means. What do you mean? <laughs> how, how can I be more conservative than you if we have the same view? Either you think this is right and that's wrong, therefore there's implications of that being wrong, or you don't yeah. really think it's that wrong. And, that, and that's the yeah. issue. I think we've seen that kind of compromise in Methodism, even with the evangelicals within Methodism, there's been yeah. compromise. So we didn't, there wasn't a strong enough a robust critique so there are really good faithful evangelicals within methodism who are still right. fighting uh, for but but i think they're they're really they've been silenced over all of this so many of them left over the over the vote but those who stayed have felt they've had to be silenced and I've, i some of my students who are part who are methodist ministers and others have had to quietly continue and, and and it's been really hard for them they've had to make really hard choices do i stay do i go if i stay what can i say etc joe um you have your own connection with Cliff College of Methodism. Tell us about that. Yes. Um, so back in uh, 2010, so you know, 13 years ago now, um, I graduated from Cliff College with my master's degree from the University of Manchester. I'm not sure if that's still the, the degree granting university. Aaron would be able to clarify that. Um, but um, so 15 years ago, yes, I did there. So a long time ago for me and, and long before Aaron's time there, I actually did the 
uh, MA in missiology there, mission and evangelism. And uh, I, <clears throat> interestingly, chose the college in part because I felt that uh, what was emanating from Cliff in this whole area, my interest was in cultural apologetics, uh, Christian cultural philosophy, what, what is the kingdom of God and so on. That what was already beginning to emanate from Cliff was this, there were programs in the emergent church uh, movement, um, and these were viewed, as Aaron will, will I'm sure, um, clarify uh, pretty positively at the time. And so the drift, in my view, was already uh, setting in back then. Uh, <clears throat> not that there weren't good people there and some some solid lecturers there uh, like Aaron, but there was a distinct drift already. And I should hasten to add, I was far from the most popular uh, student um, <laughs> at the at the college at that time. And in fact, I wasn't able to because I was living in North America. I'd been by at that point, I'd been in North America uh, for about. Oh, I see you're studying remotely with them. I see. Yeah, so I was well. the 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 program is was uh, one of the appeals of the program is at the time it was three major papers followed by a dissertation. I think four major papers, sorry, followed by a dissertation, uh, and so a lot of it was independent. And then you would come over a uh, couple of times a year for intensive study periods. So I actually did mm -hmm. it from North America because it had that much more British uh, uh, approach to a research degree um, than the sort of mm -hmm. North American masters that are often look much more like glorified bachelor's degrees. They're not yeah, taught, they're, taught they're, yeah. they're, they're taught, they're not really research based. My interest was was research. Yeah. And uh, and I thought that I need to come to grips with the whole challenge of uh, a, a Christian apologetic, a cultural apologetic. I was trying to reflect on my years in Christian mm -hmm. apologetics through doing this master's program and reflect in some detail on what the challenges were. And, and I felt that uh, some of the actual challenges that were facing the church were emanating through some of these emphasis and some of these programs at that time. So mm. now Aaron's on the tail end of, of that sort of um, movement uh, that's been happening for a while. And I, I won't say who it was, but when I did go to collect my um, master's degree, because I wasn't able to attend the graduation, the director of studies did graciously say that they were glad to see the back of me um, <laughs> at, the, <laughs> at the college um, because I was a little bit of a thorn in the flesh to some of the professors there with some of the questions I would pose and some of the discussions and debates I was getting into uh, with them. But I found it useful, I have to say, because it actually uh, led to further research and study for my doctoral work um, and then the publication of my of my book, The Mission of God. So there is an interesting connection there for me. And, and I'm, I was aware of Aaron, not, not personally directly, but um, through a family member who has uh, done a lot of heating engineering's work at uh, the college and has spoken very highly of Aaron um, and his, uh, as a faculty member there, somebody sort of holding the line and um, standing for orthodox biblical truth. So Aaron, Let's get into your tweet now. Just, I think we've got an image of the tweet that we can show. Um, tell us about why you posted this tweet and what you were trying to achieve with it. There is um, homosexuals invading the church. Evangelicals no longer see the severity of this because they are busy apologizing for apparently barbaric homophobia, whether or not it's true. This um, emphasized is a quote gospel issue quote, by the way, if sin is no longer sin, we no longer need a savior. So what motivated you to start says February 19th? So there you, there you are, it is about five weeks. Um, what motivated you to post that tweet? Tell us what your thoughts were and why you posted it. Yeah, the, so you'll notice actually it says 8 a.m. on the tweet, exactly. Yeah. It, it was a um, scheduled tweet. I wrote it a few days earlier. Right. Um, and I actually had a check a few days. I think I, must have, I might have written it four or five days earlier. And um, I went and had a look at it again. I might have tweaked one or two words. I, I really considered the language. And so it's quite in, one of the most interesting things about it is the the kind of tutting evangelicals who who wouldn't speak like that even if they'd agree with what I would say they just think wouldn't want to speak almost like this thing I was mentioning earlier we're not as conservative as you on the issue we as though I don't really care about the issue 
it doesn't really matter that much. And I understand the difference of people having different hills to die on. There are you can't talk about every issue in every you know in, in the most um, in the strongest way you'd like to in every context. So you have to always do. You're always doing cultural apologetics to use Joe's term that he wanted to engage when he was at Cliff. It, that that's and that's absolutely what we carried on trying to think about reading the culture. That's what I've been teaching my students for the last seven years in all the modules about how we think wisely about the context we're in. Um, and it's something that I, I've been speaking about. I, I haven't gone to town on homosexuality invading the church or to ever in lectures, but I have spoken about the challenges of how quickly things in the West have moved uh, in the last in the last six or seven years specifically, actually, obviously even more so since 2020, but I think it's been happening for a while. And um, yeah, so, so the whole, con the wider context is what's happening in the culture, what's happening in the church, how the world is infiltrating the church, uh, with its ideas, especially LGBT ideology. It's obviously off the scale in terms of comparing it to, to previous eras. And there's all the, there's just this horrendous lie around that all these conservative evangelical churches have been homophobic. Of course, there are some who have. I'm sure there has been actual homophobia where people have discriminated wrongly against people. But I would suggest that mu that, that would be in a minority of evangelical churches who genuinely love the gospel and love the Bible. Because there's enough in the Bible, if you care about the authority of Scripture all the way down, you, you're not going to get away with just discriminating against a, a particular person for a particular sin. Sure. So I would critique any conservative evangelical who had been barbarically homophobic to someone. But I'm yeah. really dubious of all of these institution leaders on their platforms or in their tweets or in their public statements that are all nicely airbrushed and varnished. We're so, so sorry about homosexual about homophobia. If we've ever harmed the LGBT community, we're so, so sorry. Now, mm. I just don't believe them most of the time. I don't believe they actually think they are homophobic. I believe they feel like they have to say that in order mm. to be able to say the small amount they might want to say, but we just, I'm so sorry, it still is a sin according to the Bible. I think we can't read it any other way. We're totally open to another another way of reading it. If, if you know, if you just show, we're happy to keep talking about it as long as we're not homophobic. It's like, just get over yourself. Just believe it and proclaim it. You believe it, don't you? If you do not believe it. And so that's the thing that really frustrated me. So in and around the same-sex marriage um, blessing. So that was really the motivation. That, that yeah. was really the motivation, your frustration with all of these kind of, you know, overly apologetic um you know statements and and stuff from church leaders and others you know about homophobia and homophobic things mm -hmm. and and how badly homosexuals have been treated and so on this was really your motivation that that motivated you mm -hmm. to yeah and, and then the, really the immediate context so the immediate context would be the anglican uh, blessings of obviously of same-sex relationships so that's why i've been debating on twitter the last few weeks before the tweet with various lgbt vicars etc who seem to think that that this whole idea came from them reading the Bible um, and nothing to do with what's happened in the world first, nothing to do with the world jumping first and us following the world. No, mm. it was always in there in the Bible. Maybe the spirit was blowing where he, where he wills in the culture and we must learn from them. And that's illuminated the Bible in a new way. I just, I just, the whole approach to that, I just think is it's disingenuous. And so that's what motivated it. It wasn't me bringing it up in a pointless way. It was saying that here's the context we're in. This is what we need to speak about now. And so I'm going to speak about it, and we need to speak about it strongly. So that was the reason, really. And um, Joe, you would presumably very much sympathise with that perspective. Absolutely. the uh, The simple reality is, is the most fundamental distinction that God makes in Scripture at the beginning of creation, as far as human life is concerned, is the is the male female distinction, and the Bible begins with a marriage between a man and a woman, the relationship of God to his people uh, in the older covenant is described as a marriage in which in, in the context where Israel is a faithless bride uh, and God is the jilted husband. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the Lord Jesus comes to us uh, through the Holy Family. His first miracle is performed at a wedding uh, he then um, goes back to creation in his teaching on marriage to Genesis 1 and 2 and unequivocally defines the, the, the nature of marriage. And history, uh, the, the, the church's relationship, uh, according to Paul, is defined best by the image of marriage, of the church being the bride of Christ. Um, and history ends with a marriage, the marriage supper of the Lamb. The idea that Christianity can throw off and throw over 
a scriptural view of marriage, a biblical view of male and female in the permanent bond of marriage is, Aaron is right, utterly a disingenuous. It is a lie. The notion that anybody could draw uh, the validity, supposed validity of homosexual marriage, in inverted commas, from the Bible is the height of absurdity and academic dishonesty and it's done for ideological reasons i think when we were sort of chuckling a little bit earlier or at least you were tim at the sort of the the shock of the the apparent contradiction and living with the uh contradiction i would say that what's happened in in aaron's case uh, shows that in fact there isn't really that it isn't really a contradiction uh, in the if you can say that you can live with both views you have you have by definition thrown off the biblical view yeah and so the 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 notion the scriptural teaching and the historic teaching of the church for two millennia um on marriage as soon as you say we live with the difference is a rejection of that teaching and mm -hmm. so um the 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 uh, the supposed toleration of the biblical view the historic view the evangelical view uh yeah. is a mask it's a facade it's a lie it's yeah. a transitional phase uh for the methodist church to the um uh, basically the eradication of the and the the stamping out of the scriptural view um, to my knowledge, the current principal of Cliff College voted for uh, the acceptance of same-sex uh, marriages in Methodist churches. Um, and, you know, I think this is one of the reasons why Aaron is now in the incredibly hot water that he is in, is there was never an intention on the part of the Methodist church really to tolerate the, the the vocal, clear articulation and support of the biblical view, because by definition, they have already overthrown it. Um, and so Aaron and those like him are on the outside. And um, in, in a certain sense, he's a de facto heretic. Um, it's there in the language of the response of Cliff College, where they talk about creating a safe space that it celebrates and recognizes differences, except the difference represented by Aaron, that the biblical historic view of marriage is the true one that needs to be upheld. Um, and at the very least, the academic freedom and, and liberty of Christians to articulate, articulate it needs to be maintained. Mm -hmm. That apparently is unacceptable. And he's a potential terrorist uh, and um, needs to be disciplined and dismissed. I mean, this you couldn't make this stuff up. This is mm. this is twilight zone material uh, mm. from a Christian standpoint that a that a theological professor in a Christian college hired to teach a Christian cultural view of the kingdom of God, of mission, of apologetics. States the historic biblical view of marriage that Jesus taught and is a potential terrorist who is fired. To me, that is demonic. Mm. There's no other word for it. Aaron, take take us back. You you scheduled this tweet. Tell us about the reaction to it and how it all how it all transpired. Yeah, so it was um yeah, so it went out Sunday morning. I went off to church and um I might have checked actually on Sunday morning. Maybe there was a couple of responses starting, and I might have done a couple of quick replies, I forget exactly. And then thinking no, no more of it, because I've been in controversial little debates on Twitter the last few weeks on this issue because I, I felt it was important to talk about. So I've been debating with pro-LGBT activists um, in the Anglican Church. Then I don't know how these things happen, you know, in the providence of God, um, things, it, it kind of went viral whilst I was at church. I came back in the afternoon and it had gone, you know, 25,000 people had seen it. And Meth Cliff College had, you know, a few hours earlier even responded to it. All these high up Methodists had responded to it. I had all these what, hashtags. They responded, hashtag. How have they responded in a, within a few hours on a Sunday? Yeah, I know. It's interesting, isn't it? I think the Liberals weren't at church, obviously. Um, so it's intriguing. Uh, the, so I didn't actually have much conservative support. But that would how make sense. Respond, how did they, what was their response? 
And the, <coughs> the, the, the college, the, so the college's response was to denounce the tweet to say this is uh, we, we, you know, we've been the usual bureaucratic language. We've we've been made aware that there's some comments from one of our lecturers this morning regarding sexuality. Let us just say that these are unacceptable and inappropriate. They do not re they do not represent the views or the ethos. Of Cliff College, which was really so interesting to say. Two the hours on a Sunday morning. That's extraordinary. Yeah. Well, That's I mean, I guess, you know, yeah, they'll they'll have it, it, it will have got around quickly and, and people kind of respond. Then the principal did his own response publicly as well, just to let you know from the Cliff College site, reiterating the same point, unacceptable, inappropriate, doesn't represent the college. So there was an official college response, the principal's response, and then the Methodist Church also retweeting uh, these things as well. Um, one of the trustees of Cliff College, who's a Methodist. Um, well, they're all Methodists, um, saying, you know, I'm here in my role with the college. If anyone's distressed uh, by the by the tweet this morning, um, please come and let let me know. This person is himself in a, in a same-sex marriage as well, one of our trustees. Oh, well, a trustee and, in a same-sex. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I was going to, um, I was really tempted to put a comment and say, I'm pretty distressed uh, by this, by the harassment <laughs> I've received. Yeah. Am I welcome? Am I welcome to receive this, um, you know, this kind of pastoral support you're offering? I presume not, because as uh, Joe alluded to earlier, this doesn't the the, the kind of uh, acceptance of the other view isn't really tolerated. But we're not dealing with real tolerance here. That the progressive view is incredibly intolerant, um, and it goes to the same in society. Obviously, it's the same as the woke ideology we see in society. It's not more tolerant, and the more tolerant, a more conservative um, influenced society would be far more tolerant of opposing views, as we've seen historically. And so, I just find it really intriguing. The ironies just abound here. I've basically been fired for, for blasphemy laws, breaking blasphemy laws, um, <clears throat> according to the new regime. And so it's kind of just a really interesting way how it works. And so all those debate, um, debates happened. Um, and I then quickly in the afternoon, when I had some time, I, I did a few quick stop responses, quote tweeted about five or six of the key, key kind of critiques to say, look, here, let me kind of exonerate the college. They wouldn't all put it like this. So this isn't a representative of Cliff. In its entirety, it's my view. It's not homophobic. I don't think homosexuality is worse than others. The worst, you know, the worst, the, the worst sin or something. I'm not targeting homosexuals in particular. I'm saying this is a doctrinal issue. I'm speaking to evangelicals. Of course, people are going to overhear that. It's a public platform. I recognise that. But anyone who really is being charitable or reasonable can see the point I was making. And virtually everyone on the Methodist progressive side and the atheist progressive side. You might say there's less and less a distinction between those two now, um, but they they were all reading it as homophobic, and they just thought as though I'd said homosexuals are invading the church, get rid of them, they're all terrible, let's burn them all, and it's as though I'd said that, and, and there was no understanding of the nuance or, or charity. It's thinking, what's he actually trying to say here, and is he allowed to say it? I mean, yes, I am allowed to say it, and the college disagreed, and so that's where where it's ended up. Um, do you want me to elaborate on how that happened? I mean, yes, and the, please do. Yeah. Yes. So, so the next day, I go into um, my office, and I find an email they'd sent me the day before. I don't check my emails on a Sunday. I'm at church, and so on that Sunday afternoon, they'd sent an email saying, we, you know, we. Um, I think after they'd already publicly <laughs> made their comments, so they didn't call me up or anything and have a conversation. They just said, we think this violates the social media policy. Um, we'd like you to take it down at this point. And I said, I can't do that in good conscience. This is what I believe. And I certainly can't do it now uh, in light of everything that's happened. It would be it would be completely wrong of me to do that. And I couldn't do it. And so I said, I'd be grateful to have a conversation because uh, they said, we'll be we'll have a conversation, I'm sure, at some point. And I said, yes, grateful for a conversation because I wanted to tell them what I thought about what they did. Um, later that day, I get someone to a meeting, which wasn't a conversation uh, by the principal just to say, I, this isn't a conversation. Um, you can ask some questions about process, but I need to read you your suspension letter. And I need to tell you that you need to be off the site um, by 5 p.m. I think, we, you know, we're to, this was like 4.30. On the Monday like, after you tweeted yeah. on the Sunday. Yeah. And they said, and if you're not out of your office by 5 p.m., we're going to have to send someone there to make sure that's the case. And he'd taken, they'd taken, the reason that they'd taken advice and that was them following protocol and process, et cetera, it wasn't personal. It wasn't a, pre, uh, you know, it was a non-prejudicial investigation. We just have to go this process. And I kind of think there have been so many people who've done things over the years at that college, um, which were far worse than my tweet, who would never have been asked to leave and be escorted from the building if they didn't leave within the next half an hour, as though they are dangerous to other people. I wasn't allowed to speak to other students. I wasn't allowed Wait to speak within to Within the next half colleagues. an hour? Within the next half yeah. an hour? You're given yeah, so half an hour's notice? 
yeah to, to get to get to get my get the stuff out of my office that I needed for the next couple of weeks and to and also to say what work have I got over the next two weeks and I had a heck of a lot on to try and work out who to pass that on to and so as far as I was concerned at that point I was like whoa I didn't know you could just suspend me immediately okay that was really shocking um but I kind of still then thought look I've got a t I've got one of these intensives that Joe mentioned that he came to visit we, my MA program that I ran was in intensive blocks. So I had a new unit I was teaching. I was doing 12 90 minute lectures in a week. Um, and so I said, well, that's in two weeks time. So how am I going to prepare for that if I'm not allowed to do any work? But in, so in my head at that point, I'm thinking, obviously, they're just going to investigate they didn't, and then I'll just come back to work and then it will go on. There'll be some warning and I'll probably challenge that warning. It'll be discussed. I had no idea that it, it would be like we're basically going to fire you um, after this investigation without any warning, any disciplinary previously. So it was very strange to me. But then I was, as I took advice from other people, they said, oh, yeah, that, this is what's going to happen when I passed, when I said what um, what the recommendations of that report were when I was brought it at the end. It was like, yeah, you're probably going to be fired. I was like, this just seems bizarre that they could do it that fast. I thought it was quite hard to fire people in this inclusive woke society um, nowadays. People often say that as employees. It's really hard to fire someone if you want to get rid of them. But apparently not. You just have to tweet something. How long was uh, it before they they had you then? How long was that? Uh, that was just uh, 8th of March is, is when I was dismissed. Right. So um, it, it was, yeah. And then there's a process of appeal, which is still um, ongoing. And we'll see how what kind of happens with that. But it's it's just interesting. The, that, the appeal goes to Methodism, which is intriguing. Yeah, I'll let you wonder over that. Um, so it's, yeah, it was a very strange situation to be in. But I, by the point I'd got to the disciplinary, though it was a long day, and, and a lot of argument, uh, you know, uh, my, my chance to kind of give my view, which I was grateful of. I don't, I don't even begrudge the way the principal handled the disciplinary. I do begrudge the way the report was done by the person who, who did the investigation. And it was incredibly um, unfair. And I, and I said that publicly I know, to the principal. I said, I'm going to have to talk about this publicly. And he knew that that would be uh, likely. And um, so it was, I just think there was, there was no evidence cited in my favor in this report. It was, um, a 17 page report on my tweet and it was all um couched in the way of, of saying here's all of the reasons why uh, aaron has brought the college into disrepute basically and yet i had in that time that same period those publicly and privately both myself and the principal and the world had seen the amount of support that i'd received for tweeting what i tweeted and the critique of the college for what how they'd responded both in their public statements and in suspending me uh, so I just, I, I, I argued even in my suspension meeting the day after the tweet, I said, I think the college has already brought itself into disrepute and Methodism has brought the college into disrepute by um, not allowing this other view to be shared, which I have told you for years is going to happen. Because the reason this all happened is because going back to that two views of marriage thing, yeah. it was never considered the I, the concept of sin and people who really care about sin mattering. Mm -hmm. So progressives, they can just they can cover it all over and say, yeah, 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 there's sin. But let's just tell, let's just Jesus loves you. The all in, mm -hmm. all inclusive love of God. It's so wonderful. Let's just not talk about sin. That's what Westboro Baptist type, you know, meanies do. And we're just talking about the love of God. Can we always just talk about the love of God? So, well, yeah, of course. The love of God also includes the exposure of sin and the judgment upon sin. That is actually part mm -hmm. of the love of God as well. And so they don't understand that if an evangelical disagrees with that view, they have to be able to share it. If, they, if you're going to call them a brother in Christ, you can't just say to your brother, hmm, I'm really delighted with you being in this situation where your, uh, be, your sin is being condoned. You can't leave that alone. And they never really considered it. They try to sweep no. it in very quickly by saying, don't worry about no. sin. It's just two different views of marriage. Just accept them both. And so because of that, the fallout is just my... my my tweet's been read in the way it has because they've never really considered what it meant for someone to really believe the, that homosexual marriage is wrong and the implications of that belief. That's what's caused the trouble here. And that's what Methodism is, is going to have to deal with now if they haven't already thought about that. I mean, they're going to have to think about it. Yes. And I can see um, people here like, um, is it Mary Ade asking here, Christian saying, please have a question. How is it even legally possible for Christian to be fired just like that? I thought there were provisions concerning dismissal, et cetera, with employment laws and laws. Well, you know, this, let's see, uh, this may end up in court. We shall see. And, and the, the case that springs to mind is uh, Felix de Gaulle's case. So you know that case, Aaron, 
Um, he was expelled from university at Sheffield. He was a student, actually, not, not a lecturer like you. A student expelled from university studying for social work. And he, he had posted on Facebook in his own private capacity um, that marriage is between man and woman and that sexual ethics is reserved, you know, sexual mm. activities reserved for marriage so defined. And an anonymous student reported him to the university and the university expelled him for that. Now, you know, four years later after a legal battle, we won that case and he won. He he then, he got taken back onto the course and is now qualified, is now working as a social worker. Mm. And it sets a precedent that you can't just be, you know, they can't just be a bar to employment, put it that way, um, for expressing a biblical sexual morality on social media. And and I, I'm not a lawyer myself, but I would have thought that case would have some you know, locus in your own case um, here. And mm. um, and would certainly have implications for Cliff College and what they've done to you. And, and, and certainly because it's actually an emanation of my academic free speech, which is a particularly protected right yeah. you know, in, in kind of law. So it's not... And people would say, well, that's not an academic opinion. You just spouted off something stupid and clumsy. So like, no, it isn't. I've, I've, I've written in academic peer reviewed journal articles of the need to speak radically into the culture that we're in with proclamation. I've been writing about that for, uh, in, in some ways, for over a decade, even before I came to Cliff. But even more recently, my work on, on Kierkegaard, for example, he's somebody who equally was uh, a bit of a scourge to the corruption of the church in his time. And so I've written stuff saying we need to speak about sin and the gospel. And I actually quoted this in my appeal in appropriately strong words when the context requires it. And I've even mentioned about how social media needs to be the place where we do that, because that's the agora of our time. That's where the marketplace yeah. of ideas is. It's, you need to be out there saltily speaking graciously, but saltily in those contexts. So it's not that it's even I can prove that actually my research goes in that direction anyway. So they, if there was a problem with me doing this, it ought to have been flagged well in advance. Yes, and and it's and it's raises all sorts of significant questions about free speech, but also, like you say, academic freedom and academic speech, as well. Um, Joe, what's your what's your thoughts on all of that and the implications for Christian ministry going forward in this kind of way? Well, this is this is a drumhead trial, is is what's happened. It's in the uh, you know older military they would just uh you know turn a drum over and and um, hold a trial right there and uh, summary execution followed um and um as aaron aaron has said um this is uh, this is actually a case of of um of, of blasphemy he's fallen afoul of the new blasphemy laws yeah. you know the notion that we in our culture and society um have simply repealed our blasphemy laws isn't true They've mm. simply shifted in terms of blasphemy mm. against the new God. Mm. And this is what we're seeing, you know, throughout culture. When you see uh, law changing, um, when you see the nature and character of education changing, academic freedom in, in this case as well, you know that the God of that society has been changed. There's a new source of sovereignty. There's a new source of ultimacy. And... Um, Aaron mentioned the fawning of evangelical organizations and leaders all over the LGBTQ movement um, and uh, the, the apologizing for homophobia, which basically says that you're mentally ill if you uh, suggest that homosexuality is a sin. Um, mm. And we, we find ourselves now in this situation where to speak plain Christian truth, even in an academic context, backed up by theological or academic research. And this in <laughs> the amazing thing about this one is we're now in a historically evangelical school, which purports to be a center for global mission. Um, well, the vast majority of the globe's Christians today, the center of Christianity has long since shifted to the global south, would absolutely stand with Aaron on this issue. Global yeah. Christianity represents biblical Christianity, not the critical theory of, of cultural Marxists yeah. emerging from Europe. That oh, yeah, definitely. The life of the yeah. church. Um, and so the, the, in, in terms of Christianity, Cliff College is articulating the absolutely the minority position. This is precisely yeah. why global Anglicanism is now breaking up and uh, are, are saying that they no longer accept the Sea of Canterbury. Um, yeah. there, there, there's broken fellowship. 
because the, because the center of Christianity is no longer the Northern Hemisphere. It certainly isn't Great Britain, um, and it's not Europe. So uh, I would say that, you know, from the positive side, it's Aaron who is on the right side of history, uh, as we would say here, uh, you know, in, in culturally. And uh, he's obviously on the right side of the argument, but he's on the correct side of this in terms of global mission, the global church, uh, the challenge facing our culture. One of the things that um, Aaron alluded to in one of uh, the follow-up emails that he did, which I found interesting, uh, was that when uh, institutions and churches go down this route, it's usually indicative that they are already in a state of decline. When I saw this, I actually said that Cliff College is, is simply putting a nail into its own coffin here. Look, the reality is, and I don't want to be rude, um, but the Methodist movement was infiltrated by liberalism, you know, a good hundred years ago, like many of the mainline churches. There were lots of evangelicals who held the line, but this has been going on for some time, this capitulation. And the, this, the, the, the result has been the closing of Methodist chapels at an incredible rate. At one point, it was as many as one a week. The Methodist movement is already on life support. Methodist Cliff College is on life support. You yeah. could, uh, um, you'd be hard put to have found 50 people at their last major conference uh, that uh, used to used to attract hundreds of people to it. They're struggling for students. They're building uh, additions on the college. Who are they going to put in them? Because nobody's going. And the more liberal that they become, the more the more apostate that they become, the quicker they sign their own death warrant as a Christian institution. There is no longer any kind of Christian distinctive. The reason that Methodism was able to grow the way it did in the 18th century was because faithful people like John Wesley and George Whitfield and Fletcher of Maidley and many others, the whole connection movement and so on, these people were faithful evangelicals who believed the word of God, were concerned about apostasy in the church, concerned about the um, the watering down of the gospel, and so on. And it led to, you know, a powerful evangelical movument being established and numerically strong. These, I don't understand why we cannot learn this basic lesson of history that God has taught us time and again. If you compromise the word of God, if you adulterate the word of God, all things in mission, in evangelism, uh, we should know this. You are condemning yourself. You're condemning the church you represent. You are condemning the institution that you occupy ultimately to oblivion and God's judgment. I'm so sorry to say it because um, there were good people at Cliff. Aaron is absolutely one of the leading lights. They've had a venerable history, but they are on life support, and shortly God is going to pull the plug, and they'll all be out of a job if they continue this. So, um, Aaron, it may be too early to say, really, but when it's for you, what, what, where are you thinking? What are you thinking in terms of what you might or what, what happens next for you? Yeah, so I, I've set up a, um, a, a crowd funder to sort of raise support for the kind of forward steps in terms of what I feel is needed. And just what Joe's alluding to, there's there's many institutions that are evangelical um, who are on life support similarly, or even those who are conservative are potentially drifting. I, I it, it genuinely saddens me when I think of the legacy of Cliff College in the direction it's gone. Even years before even Joe or I were there, it would be far different to what it was like in Samuel Chadwick's time the time when they used to send out um, evangelistic teams everywhere uh, called Trekkers, and they were just so gung-ho. I, I, I read, I used to love reading the little booklets of the history of Cliff College and, and, uh, and of course, uh, Primitive Methodism, uh, which is probably more, more broadly, which is probably like kind of the more spiritual roots of, of, um, of where some of those emphases in the college came from, even if there's different Wesleyan streams that sort of facilitated Cliff's history. But I think what's happened with Cliff, it's a microcosm of what's probably going to happen with lots of other institutions that are plugged into a system 
which is going to make them so worried about their reputations in order to carry on uh, charging lots of money for degrees that it's going to be really difficult for them to keep going it faithfully. So I know there are some who are going to hold out. There's clearly some really good institutions in the UK. But for me, I feel like it's a moment in which we have to start thinking more creatively and imaginatively about theological education going forward. And we might need to think of models like Finkenwalder and um, Bonhoeffer, um, where he had to set up an underground seminary or, or we, to, to get faithful theological education. And the phrase I've come up with is shamelessly biblical. We need shamelessly biblical theological education where we're not apologizing for it. We're just going to tell you that this we really believe it's God's wisdom in the Bible. We don't believe it's, I'm so sorry, it's in the textbook. I have to agree with it. And I wish I didn't have to, I wish it wasn't here. Yeah. No, if you see that it's true and that's good because God said it, or it isn't. So go and give up the Bible and do something else or believe the Bible, stand on it, preach it and declare it and teach it and be faithful and whatever that means in, in your generation. So that's why I think we need to train leaders for the next generation to fight the battles that all Christians are going to face uh, in these kind of d in darkened times in the West. So I, I've been I've, I've had messages. I've basically been a full time correspondent over the last few weeks, responding to thousands of messages from Christians around the world. And they recognize, they resonate with my situation because they say, oh, my goodness, if this is happening, what's going to happen to me? Well, exactly. That's why we need people who are going to be trained well to stand upon the word uh, and not give up and to, to take courage. So for me, the next steps are whatever that means. I don't have particular uh, plans for it. But I, have, I have lots of visionary plans of how I'd like to network and write towards the end of um, perhaps building new institutions. And people speaking to people like Joe, I'm sure, will be helpful uh, as part of that, because I know he's been doing that for years anyway. So that's kind of where I'm tentatively heading. That's what I'm praying into. And I feel God's really called me uh, to think and uh, and plan towards in some way. So the, the future is kind of uncertain, but I know that there's a rough direction of travel. I know what the priorities are. That's what that's what. And that's enough for me for now. That sounds sounds great, and we'll definitely be praying for you, Aaron. And I think maybe my colleagues can find your crowd um, funder and put it on the um, on the on the chat there um, for people to see as well. Um, and thank you so much for standing up and your stance and how well you've articulated it and explained it um, to us today. And um, I'm sure that God will bless you for the stance you've taken in all of this. Um, thank you for joining us, Joe, as well. Appreciate your wisdom and perspective on this and to all the rest of you for listening in and watching as well uh what a great discussion do pray for aaron and uh do follow us on youtube facebook twitter and look forward to catching up with you probably next week thank you very much amen thanks tim cheers joe